the adjustable desk lamp made out of aluminium tubing, aluminium sheet, plywood, corrugated cardboard and acrylic. All the resources, processes, steps and materials are all included into this video and by the end of watching this video you should be able to understand exactly how to go ahead and make this lamp for your engineering project. The quality of this lamp would be graded at a distinction level. So this is the required resources now. As you can see, left to right at the bottom there, you've got your three mil plywood, corrugated card, followed by the three mil plywood, and they are all for the uh, for, for laminating the base together. Aluminium sheet, acrylic, the nylon bolts, more acrylic, and then you've got the USB cable. There is also a length of aluminium tube towards the bottom of the photograph. So, on the next video, or the next, on this next bit, should we say, we've got the process number one, which is to drill the nylon bolts. Now, the nylon bolts, you will have five altogether, but only three need to be drilled with a four millimeter drill bit. So we set up the machine vise, as you can see here, and we we make um, a makeshift jig, essentially, with a threaded aluminium tube inside of the cheeks of the vise. We bring the drill bit down. We can move the vise around with our left hand so that we can ensure we are centralized with it when the drill bit hits the top of the bolt head. The bolt will then be quite tight inside of that thread, so we can use the pliers to undo it, just to break that um, the, the, the tightness of it. Then you can just loosen it with your hand and then clean the drill bit afterwards for the next user to come along and, and drill his or her nylon bolt. So you'll do this three times. You only need to thread the bolt into the top a couple of turns, and as the drill bit comes down and touches the top of the bolt it will cause the bolt to spin round and thread itself down the the tube make sure you wear safety glasses for this stage process number two laminating the base So we're going to use PVA, 5mm beads, circular motion or a spiral. This will create a good suction in between the two layers. Place the second layer on there, give it a spin around, move it round, make sure the glue is spread evenly across the surface area. Same thing for the next layer of corrugated card. Make sure that the hexagons line up properly. And then get your two nylon bolts, one with a drilled hole or a bored hole, and one that's solid. The solid one goes towards the center, the one with the hole goes towards the outside of the base. So you place that in there just to make sure that the layers are lined up. Flip it over and place the roll of masking tape in between the two bolts. And then you can place a weight on top of that masking tape. Leave that for five to 10 minutes, clean up any excess glue that may have spilt out. Now we can carefully add the USB cable through the hole of the outside bolt. We've got to make sure that we've got at least 200 millimeters of the USB cable, no more than 200 mil. Approximately 200 millimeters cable coming out from the bottom of the bolt we can use a ruler for that if you want to. So we, we check that and then we'll get some more PVA. Attach it, attach the third piece of corrugated card. Again, circular motion to ensure that sucks in the vacuum. So when you push the layer down onto the glue, it's less likely to come back off. We can always glue, we can always remove any excess of the glue later on. While we've got 
to this stage now we're going to put another circular bead of PVA around there and now we can attach the base the base is three millimeter plywood we place this on the table now again add the masking tape in between the two bolts and then the weight on top of the masking tape now is a good time to get the engineers square just to make sure that the all the layers are in line as much as possible if they're a little bit off it doesn't matter because we can neaten this up later on so process number three is removing the bird marks in the video I've used a belt sander but you could use a disc sander a palm sander or you could just use a file whichever your workshop um, has really so I'm carefully going around I'm being careful not to sand the cable plus it won't work I what what I'm aiming for here is for the two plywood layers to be flush with each other make sure that all the burn comes off both layers so if the bottom layer is sticking out a bit more than the top layer you want to make sure that you sand right down to that top layer but at the same time you still have to try and make sure you've got that curve an even radius all around doesn't matter if you're sanding the cardboard you're going to do that once we get to the cable we're going to put the base in, into the wood working vice not the metal working vice there's too much dirt and grease in the metal working vice so we'll get the file now make sure that you put the smooth side of the file next to the where the cable is so that we don't file any of the insulation away from the cable we'll spend a bit of time probably 10 minutes filing away and neatening up that, that last bit of burn next to the cable a bit of draw filing a bit of cross filing okay so it's looking even now it's the same shade it's all clear can't see any burn next thing we'll do get some 240 grit paper and go ahead and sand the top of the base where all the burn has been left from the laser cutter so when the laser beam cuts through the wood it does create a bit of smolder a bit a bit of um, burn evidence on the top of where the engraving is or where the cut has been when you do sand around any engraving it kind of looks like the engravings being sanded away but in actual fact it's just dust from the sanding so you will need to either blow or get yourself a vacuum cleaner and, and just remove any of the dust from the surfaces you're going to need to make sure you've removed the dust also because we're going to be varnishing all all the surface area very shortly so process number four finishing the base we're going to use a water-based fast drying clear varnish for this one so many reasons why we use the water-based one is it's odorless so it doesn't give you a sore throat two is it dries really quick so you can essentially give it two coats in the same lesson so we coat, paint all around the outside first around the edge first Make sure you're getting all the little recesses but we don't want to have so much on the brush that it drips and runs and makes a an unsightly mess either on the desk or on the on the product so i'll place it now on that on that blue pot but obviously you can place it onto ma a roll of masking tape or whatever just to raise it off the surface so that when the varnish dries it doesn't attach the base to the to the worktop wherever you're working make sure you're not working next to anyone who's sanding or filing at the moment because you want to get all dust in your varnish whilst it sets so i've given this three coats altogether process number five is folding the stand bracket what we do here is with the posca pen go over any engraving 
And as soon as you've covered all the engraving, or up to 10 seconds, whichever comes first, we then get the paper towel and remove any excess quickly before it sets on the surface of the acrylic and not just in the engraving part. Once that's done, we can take it over to the strip heater and you'll see the 30 millimeter contoured line that we did. That line is going to go directly over the hot filament of the strip heater. 10 seconds each side, no more than 10 seconds or else this will blister or burn the acrylic. 10 seconds each time, each side until the acrylic softens. Once it's softened, we can then place it into the jig, place it into the jig up to the line. We can then fold on a 90 degree angle. Again, we'll use the engineer's square to ensure we've got that 90 degree. If you didn't, if you don't get it right first time, just heat it back up again. Process number six, forming the bracket. Now this is the clamp bracket. So the oven is warmed up to 200 degrees. So we'll just do the poskering again. Make sure you clean everything up. And we're going to place the piece of acrylic into the oven now for about four minutes on 200 degrees. Get your oven gloves on. Now if the acrylic is soft like a piece of paper, it's ready. So we'll place it into the two piece mold, add the six mil plywood, add the 12 mil tube inside there, squeeze it, stick it in the vise, allow it to cool. Two minutes later, here we have the clamp bracket. Now what we'll find is the holes, this 8mm hole here, usually don't line up. So we'll take it over to the jig on the pillar drill and we will clamp it up, tighten it down and we'll put a piece of masking tape around the drill bit. That's an that's a 8mm um, drill bit. Drill straight through that hole, the top hole, and that will find a new hole or just widen the, the hole at the bottom, on the bottom surface. Either way, You'll now be able to get your adjustable bolt through both holes. Process number seven is cutting the aluminium. So you've got these two upper stands here. The first one we're going to cut is the 300 millimeter top arm. Get your engineer's ruler, your engineer's scriber, and your pipe cutter so you spin it twice and then tighten the black lever spin twice tighten spin twice twice and then tighten again um, do that five times the pipe should cut and it's much neater much more accurate finish than using the hacksaw than having to file it and getting all uh, the measurements wrong so pipe cutter then we get the deburring tool, which was that red tool you just saw me use. That cleans out any any sharp edges, any any burr from inside and outside of the tube. Now I'm just cutting the 200 mil lengths. So we've got two 200 mils. We've got one 300 mil. So process number eight is cutting the internal threads. As you can see in the photograph, we want to put a thread, five threads all together, a thread at either end of the 200 mil and a thread at one end of the 300 mil. With the tap and wrench I'm using there, you can see I've just used a bit of lubrication there, just to make the uh, reduce the friction involved in the contact of metal to metal surfaces. I spin, it, spin the wrench to the right, clockwise, one full turn, then back anti-clockwise, half a turn. Clockwise, one full, anti-clockwise, half. Do that all the way down until you can't see the thread on the tap anymore. Bring it back out and wind it back down 
two or three times just to clear out any of the excess swarf that might be lying in the new cut thread. So we do that five times. Again, we'll get the deburring tool, clean the inside of the wall at the top there, and then we'll clean the outside of the wall at the top with the other side of that deburring tool. Very good little, little piece of kit. With the deburring tool, the external part, you can also put a nice chamfer on the outside of your aluminium tube. And we'll do that. We'll see that in a minute, actually. So we've got the, the top arm here. We're only going to thread one end of the top arm. Just add a little bit more of the, the lubricant there to the um, to the, the tap, just to make it cut the inner wall a bit easier. Make sure you keep everywhere clean. Always have a clean house. So process number nine is plugging the top arm. As you can see in the photograph, we've used a 9.6 millimeter aluminium bar to plug one end of that top arm. It's not the end that we've just cut a thread on. It's the opposite end to that. The aluminium tube ID, so the internal diameter is 9.2 mil. The bar is 9.6. So we have to drill out or bore the inside diameter to 9.6 millimeters. Put the drill on slow, get your bar, hammer it down till it's really tight. However much is sticking out, we then put it back into the vise and we use our hacksaw, senior hacksaw, to cut off the excess. I've put the paper towel, wrapped the paper towel around the aluminium there, just to prevent the any scratches occurring on the um, on the on the finished outside wall. Okay, so the teeth marks left by the saw can be removed with the file. Very light, very light filing there, cross filing, and then the teeth marks from the file can be removed with some two hundred and forty grit. Once I'm happy that I can't see the difference between the original tube and the bar, that's that's the point where you've you've done enough sanding. So I'll finish off with some 400 grit and add a chamfer. Just using the, the deburring tool there to chamfer to put a 45 degree angle at the top. Then again, go over with the 400 grit paper and whilst I'm there I'm going to make sure there's no other scratches process number 10 is preparing the the stands and, and the top arm for going on to the buffer so I'll look for any deep scratches if you can get your nail into a scratch you're going to need to use the emery cloth if you can't get your nail into any scratches, you don't need to use the emery cloth. You just use the 240 all over, then use the 400 all over. So it's all the same depth of scratch before using that liquid metal polish. And that just removes any lighter scratches and it also removes all the, all the dirt or the oil or grease or grime off of the aluminium. So the so that when you touch them in future, you don't get any of that, that black oil onto your fingers and you don't have the, the cross-contamination onto your plywood base. Process 11 is using the buffing wheel. So only one person at one time can use the buffing wheel. There's only one set of controls. We apply some wax. We buff the aluminium now that we've used all the sandpaper. And we buff, spin it round, keep moving the aluminium. And we keep applying some wax. You have to find an even balance between how much wax to apply to the wheel and how much actual buffing you need to do. So this buffing wheel is uh, fairly abrasive in comparison to the next wheel you will use. This wheel, will, uh, one wheel will put the wax on, which is the left one. And this one on the right hand side will take the wax off it. And it will show you whether you need to go on to the next wheel again because you'll, you'll see this this wheel here will make you see 
any uh, discrepancies or, or hairline scratches that you might want to either sand or buff out a bit more. So on the left is one that's been done, the right hasn't yet been buffed. Process number 12 is drilling a hole for the cable. So this will be drilled into the top arm and it's drilled into the end of the top arm where you've just done the put the plug. 50 millimeters down, center punch, hammer, a, a very minor dent, then get yourself a four millimeter drill bit. Just drill into that one side of the wall, then get yourself a five or a 5.5 millimeter drill bit. Just widen that hole a little bit. Now we can just lightly file any burr off there. Get your sandpaper, bit of 240, go up to the 400 next. This will just prevent any sharp edges touching the, um, the cable. Process number 13 is marking out the lampshade. With your aluminium sheet and the engineer's square, engineer's scriber, we find ourselves a right angle. First of all, get yourself, get your datum set up so that we know that one corner is 90 degrees. We're going to work from that corner. That's called the datum. We're working, everything's coming from that corner. So if you look on your, on your drawing sheet, the top right hand side, you'll see the, the working drawing, the plan of the lampshade. So we're going to mark out all the outside measurements, first of all, so we can reduce our sheet down to the overall size of the lampshade. Got to be very accurate here with the guillotine. Make sure that we are using the, the lines on the base so we can get accurate parallel lines cut. So we should now be able to test the corners with our engineer square to make sure we've got right angles. This little tool here is called an odd leg caliper. It's a fantastic piece of equipment. If you want to have straight lines, parallel lines, you use this. You set it at 20 millimeters and it will give you parallel lines rather than having to work it out and mark each one individually. So the next you do three 20 mil parallel lines and then this end here where the hole goes is 30 mil. Process number four is removing the internal corners of the lampshade. For this we use the end of the guillotine and we do all four cuts this way first. We're using shear force here. The guillotine works with shear force and you get to see also the shear strength of the material. We can see now how much the material has been pushed up and that's all to do with the sheer strength of the material. So if we used a mild steel, it wouldn't push up as much because the mild steel is stronger at the same thickness. But then use the other side of the guillotine blade to cut the adjacent line of the internal corner. Get yourself your ball peen hammer or your cross peen hammer just to flatten down where the aluminium lifted up from the guillotine. 15 is removing the sharp edges. So engineering advice, small flat file. Take full advantage of the smooth side of the flat file here. I'm actually using the half round just to get it into the corners because you'll notice the half round file has got a sharper corner there just to get right into that internal corner so that with a flat file you're going to have the smooth side up against the adjacent sides so that you do not interfere with that already filed and already accurate side so we'll file all the sides make sure they're all level and then we'll be able to turn the, the piece of aluminium 45 degrees and to begin to 
uh, round off all the corners to make them safe and to make them a bit more aesthetically pleasing. It's up to you how much you file these round. You might file the the um, the side with the hole that you're going to drill. You might find that you'll you'll put a, a much larger radius on those corners than you do for the rest of the um, the rest of the piece. That's what I've done with mine. So after I've filed all the corners round, I then get the same file, and I do some flat filing some cross filing whilst the piece is flat on the worktop and that just gets rid of any lips that's been created from from filing the edges so again we're thinking of safety we're thinking of aesthetics should be nice and smooth and you, that you shouldn't be able to be uh, you shouldn't be able to cut yourself anywhere from this piece of aluminium process number 16 is drilling a hole so eventually you're going to end up with a 10 millimeter hole but first of all after we've clamped the work down we've got the drill board first we've got the aluminium then we've got a clamp board clamp it down four mil hole into where you center punched swap the bit round for your 10 mil and then we need to deburr that hole so we'll get the flat file again if you don't have a deburring tool to get inside there flat file Again, this area needs to be smooth, no sharp edges. So we're happy with it, it's all filed. So we now get the 240 grit paper, go around the edges, swap it for the 400 grit paper. With the 400 grit paper, we're going to now hide any of the scratches that you've left in the aluminium there. We'll hide them by adding a nice professional finish which is a circular motion a brushed give it like a brushed effect very very small circular motions all over the surface area of one side of your aluminium very small circles some people might choose to do some diagonal lines just di diagonal from top left to bottom right and then turn it round to the opposite top right to bottom left as long as you've got an even sequence a consistent pressure or consistent pattern either one would look would look fantastic when it's finished so we do this all over again we get the liquid metal polish to clean all the, the grease grime and the oils from the aluminium if you look at the tissue now you can see all the black all the smudges that have come off get rid of all these give it a good clean And then put the lid back onto the liquid metal polish so it doesn't fall over and go all over the floor process number 17 forming the lampshade so we've got here a two-piece mold make sure you've got the colors on the bottom mold lined up with the top mold so the blue on the left front right on the uh, red on the right front top and bottom we put the the flat piece of aluminium into the recess of the bottom mold Put it into the press former, tight, loosen it, pull it out, take the top piece off and you'll see that your lampshade has now been formed. You now, you've now gone from a two-dimensional piece to a three-dimensional formed lampshade. You have to do a bit of fettling now where you just manually finish off the work. You just squeeze it, make sure you've got 90 degrees everywhere, get your engineer square for this. Squeeze, get rid of all your gaps. Now any sharp edges that you have on your lampshade, such as those corners, we're going to use the, again we'll use the small flat file and just get rid of these sharp corners. Just keep an eye on this. You don't want to do it too much. You end up with a hole in the corner instead of the, the aluminium. So you want it just nice and round, nice and tucked in. And then we can get the 240 paper and the 400 paper just very lightly. Get rid of the this, this file scratches very lightly.
Process number 18, finishing the lampshade. So safety glasses on, back to the buffing wheel. So the left one is the wax on, the right one is the wax off. This takes, this lampshade takes a bit longer than the aluminium tubes. So don't be afraid to spend half the lesson on the buffing wheel, it's fine. So when you wax off with the right hand wheel, you might find that you want to go and sand a bit more and then come back to the left wheel. That's fine. Do that whole procedure. And by the time you finish this process, you will have a nice, shiny, almost a chrome finish lampshade. Something to be proud of. After you've finished buffing, we're then going to use the tea towel, which will be near the buffing wheel. That will remove any excess wax that hasn't come off with the, um, with the buffing wheel. Process number 19 is the assembly stage. Get the base, first of all, along with all the other components all lined up next to you. Feed the cable through the aluminium tube. Before you do that, always test with the uh, spare bolt. Just just run that up through the, the threads, make sure there's no issues with the threads. We'll then get the, uh, the, the, the stand bracket, feed that through along with a bolt, a board out bolt. Stick that down, screw it in. It's a bit fiddly, but you'll manage. You could ask someone else to help you if you wish. Um, but after we've got this first bolt, secured we can just get the one of the solid bolts that we have and attach the other side of the uh, stand bracket then you'll see that your your lamp is actually now starting to take shape so it's quite rewarding to know that you've completed all this on your own so this one goes in now And then we put the clamp bracket on there next. We've bought in these bolts this time. Usually you would use the center lathe to make the adjustable bolt. So top arm goes into the stand bracket, uh, the clamp bracket, and then you can feed the cable through that hole. Process number 20, electronics. With the IP67 LED strip, we're going to cut where it shows the scissor picture there. We're going to cut that uh, four LEDs down. We're going to use the wire snips or the side cutters to cut that. We're also going to remove some of the silicon gel from the top surface in order for us to be able to access the soldering points. Just make sure that the red wire solders to the positive sign and the black wire solders to the negative sign. Add a bit of solder to the end of the iron and just gently touch the two components together and push down with the soldering iron so that the solder um, becomes soft enough to coat the two terminals together. Once that's done, slight tug, make sure it's fastened, peel back the protective sticky back film off the back of the LED strip and remove any slack from the cable. So we can now attach the LED strip to the inside of the lampshade, get it nice and parallel, plug it into the laptop and hey presto, it works. So last thing to do, just add some feet, that'll just prevent the underside of the lamp from getting scratched off the desk. As you can see, mine's got a bit scratched from the being in the workshop. And that's all. Thank you very much for watching. Good luck.